welcome to this snippet of Research Lab in Language and Perception and Thought. In this snippet, I'll be sharing some data that I've recently shared with scientific colleagues around the world about some of the research that's going on right here in Singapore about these patterns of linguistic exposure. We've been talking a lot about questions of what language do you speak and what variety of that language do you speak and how do you navigate your linguistic selves in different contexts. And I want to take one step back and say, what do we know about these patterns more broadly in Singapore? One way we can start interrogating this question is to look at official census data. So in this unit plot of 100 people resident in Singapore at the time of the 2010 census, what we can see is a breakdown by ethnic background and language for how people answered the question, what is the main language you speak at home? So we can see that across the board, 30% of households in the 2010 census were reporting that English was the main language spoken at home. We can also see that within each ethnic group, there is one dominant language, and this aligns with Singapore's official language policy. Uh, so Mandarin Chinese for the families who identify as ethnically Chinese, Malay or Bahasa Melayu for those families who identify as ethnically Malay, and uh, predominantly Tamil, if not English, for those families who identify as Indian. However, this is a fairly limited question. It only asks what is the main language spoken in your home, and it doesn't ask what other languages are also spoken there. But there are some things that we can learn about these patterns. The first thing we can learn is that the patterns are changing rapidly over time. So at the top here, you can see a comparison between the 2000 census and the 2010 census for each of those different ethnic groups. And what we can see is across the board, English, the blue color, is increasing at a very similar rate for all of these language background groups. Below, you can see a data visualization called the population pyramid. And this population pyramid shows us the distribution of people across age uh, at a particular point in time. So on the left of the population pyramid, you can see the data from, 20, uh, from 2000. And on the right of the population pyramid, you can see the data from 2010. The length of each bar tells us the number of people resident in Singapore at the time the census was taken, but broken down into separate bands of age group. So each of those bars represents five years of age. So we can see down the bottom, we have five to nine year olds. And up the top, we have 80 to 84 year olds and 85 and beyond year olds. So the first thing that we can see is that the birth rate in Singapore is declining. Over here in the 2010 data, we can see that those bars are getting shorter. We can also see that overall between 2000 and 2010, the area of the chart that is blue colored has increased uh, relative to the other languages by 2010. The other feature that we can see is that orange band, the, the Chinese dialects, is shrinking and moving up the population pyramid with time. This is sometimes referred to as aging out, as older speakers either stop using their dialects, stop reporting that they're using their dialects, or are no longer counted in the census data at all. But even with all of this rich linguistic data about the distribution among groups, we're still only answering just one question. What is the main language spoken in your house? So that difference between Mandarin speakers and Chinese dialect speakers may be a difference in reporting where a family may have shifted from using 49% Mandarin and 51% dialect to 51% Mandarin and 49% dialect. You can see how this measurement tool is very blunt. It doesn't give us rich nuanced details about the nature or the form of bilingualism that these families have available to them. 
There is one other question in the Singapore census that can help us out here. And this is a question about biliteracy. This question asks for all people school age and older, what are the languages that you are literate in? So what we can see in this unit plot, again, broken down by those ethnic background groups, is 100 young people resident in Singapore, uh, 15 to 24 year olds grouped together. And we can see that around across the board, around 10% of young people report only being monoliterate in English. The other 90% on average of people resident in Singapore report literacy in two or more languages. However, it still doesn't tell us how people achieved literacy if we don't know what languages they spoke. How did they get from this pattern of main language exposure to this pattern of multi-literate functional utility in more than one language? So the perspective I wanna bring here is the census data is fundamentally limited. There are limited questions. There are no data on bilingualism, only by literacy. There's also no data on language use ratios. So there's no way to link the uh, language outcomes of a particular individual to their language inputs. It's also completely unclear whether the way people use languages at home in their early years has any impact on their language outcomes. This is quite troubling in a place like Singapore that loves evidence-based practice because nobody knows what works best for Singapore's young people in their language learning journeys. So I'm going to be sharing a little bit of information from our ongoing studies uh, in collaboration with the Gusto team and funded by the National Research Foundation of Singapore um, that touches on these questions of what are Singaporean children hearing uh, and how are their patterns of language exposure related to their language outcomes in later life. The first pattern I wanna share with you is one of incredible diversity. If we ask families how much each person spoke to them in each language and how much that caregiver contributed to their total language input, we can create a composite language input profile, a clip for each infant and find out how that child's language input was comprised of all of the different languages going on in the house. So what we see here is the gusto cohort children at six months of age. Now gusto is Singapore's largest longitudinal cohort of families who were recruited when the parents were pregnant and they're still being followed to this day. So they're about nine years of age now. Some general patterns that we noticed are that the most common pattern of input was bilingual input. So two languages were used by 71% of households. Uh, the most common and dominant the most common dominant language was English. Grandparents were very often bilingual or trilingual in their communications with six month old babies. But what we can see with this beautiful array of mesmerizing dot plots is the incredible diversity of patterns across six month old babies in Singapore. What we can do with these data though Given what we know about the fact that certain language types tend to pattern with families with certain ethnic backgrounds, is we can convert these uh, individual language mixes into a kind of mother tongue matrix. Now, the mother tongue matrix is going to reply uh, is is going to rely on a ratio of English, the prestige language and the language of the majority of education. Uh, the mother tongue language that is uh, one of Singapore's official languages, if a family reports that they use it. A classification that we call like a mother tongue variation. And this is a language that might commonly pattern with a particular mother tongue in Singapore. 
So that might be Chinese dialect if you are a Mandarin speaking household, or that might be Bahasa Indonesia if you are a Malay speaking household speaking Bahasa Malayu. Uh, and then our fourth grouping is for some other language that's not one of those. And when we convert these ratios into something that is always English, mother tongue, mother tongue variation and other, we can start to see general global patterns of language combination behavior across all of Singapore's families. And this is what it looks like. So here we have our over 400 babies once again, and we can see a patterning from uh, some families right up in the top left corner who are majority mother tongue in their communication with their children all the way through every possible permutation and combination with English, the blue color, which you can see down towards the bottom here. And then we also see a semi-separate grouping of families that use majority another language in their communications with their children. What we can do with these data is we can perform some very fancy mathematics to find what are the patterns within the data that could group the children together in interesting ways. So when we apply K means clustering to the data in this sample, we identify the best solution for how we could group these kids into uh, patterns who look most like each other and least like the patterns that we observe in different groups. So the result is four main clusters of language mixing behavior in the household. And this is what it looks like at six months. We have a large group of families who use mostly mother tongue with their children, followed by a fairly large group of families who have more or less balanced language use with their children. And then an even smaller group, but relatively similar in size overall, of families who are use, using a little bit more English with their children than mother tongue. And then we have that dramatically different, much smaller cluster for other languages. Now I'll apologize because the colors are about to change here, but bear with me for just one sec, because we can track how these cluster identities change over time. So here we can see those six month old infants one more time uh, and followed on the right hand side by the same children at 18 months of age. And what we can see is the majority of kids are still in the same cluster one year later. However, although we can build a model of what patterns of language use parents remember their children having, how can we be certain if that's actually how parents talk with their children? What we need is measures of language behavior that are recorded and collected in real time. We need to see parent-child interactions on the fly. One of the tools we use for this is a suite of speech elicitation tools, including a wordless picture book called What a Scary Storm. In What a Scary Storm, uh, parents see a se sequence of pictures that describes the adventures of a small orangutan being terribly frightened in a thunderstorm. And they can describe these actions to their children in whatever words they like. We don't ask them to stick to one language at a time. We don't tell them which language is best. In fact, we ask them explicitly to use whatever linguistic resources they would normally use with their child to tell the story the way they normally would. And this gives us a beautiful insight into the day-to-day -day language use of parents with their little kids. In addition, we had a grand plan to collect day long recordings using a specialized microphone or baby monitor like this one that goes in a little pocket on the child's clothing that is safe for babies and also baby proof, which means that you can wipe the vomit off it. However, we haven't been able to begin this branch of our work due to some 
complications arising from COVID. But we pivoted our methods into an online data collection paradigm instead. So in the online version, what we're able to do is present our little storybook on screen to a parent and a child in the context of a Zoom call and record their interactions as the parent narrates the story for their child. So I started this little description by saying we needed more insights into the way that people actually utilize their language resources on the fly. And I'm about to show you some data that we've been collecting from this storybook study. The storybook study was so successful that we have over 400 parent-child interactions collected by video call. And it's the largest collection of parent-child interactions in Singapore that we know of. I'm only going to be showing you a very small snippet of that data today. And here we have 10 of these uh, interactions between parents and children using the on-screen picture book that does not specify which language a person should speak in when they're communicating with their child. Audio files have all been transcribed by human transcribers using a technique that we call multi-tier multilingual transcription. When the transcription has been done in this way, we can process it using a Python package that we call Bella that produces both a, a, a verbal transcript, like a traditional one that you might see in language analysis, but also allows us to use all sorts of uh, fabulous visualizations. What you can see below each bar is one conversation between a parent and the child. There are 10 conversations here. Each one lasted for about 20 minutes, but they've been um, stretched to the same length for easy comparison. The top eight bars are families that report that they use a mix of English and Mandarin with their kids. We can see that one of those families uses a lot more Mandarin with their kids than others, because blue is the color that represents English in this data set. Orange is the color that represents Mandarin, and the red color represents another tier of linguistic data that is neither English nor Mandarin. We can also see in this data gray patches. Now the gray patches are uh, segments of speech, like you can see up above in this example here, something, 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 ho. Uh, these kind of utterances might occur when someone is speaking English, they might occur when someone is speaking Mandarin. So it's very hard for us to establish whether that should be classified in the context of the conversation as English or as Mandarin. If we take the translanguaging perspective, it's just another linguistic resource that's freely available to this speaker. Some of the gray patches are also the undecipherable non-linguistic parts of the conversation that, also, that come from the baby, who might not yet be using words that can be classified according to one language or another. Down the bottom, we can see a family that reports using Tamil and English with their family, where we see a majority English pattern with some occasional incursions in Tamil. Uh, and then the very final one that appears right at the bottom, you might have to switch your captions off to see it, uh, is a family that reports using Malay and English predominantly with their child. But we also see bright yellow bars that represent Arabic in there as well. So by sharing this data with you today, I want to bring you on board with the perspective that when we think about the languages that we speak, we have a variety of linguistic resources available to us. And that when we have dense intergenerational multilingualism in a place like Singapore, the way that we can move through those language resources might be quite different to the way a person who grew up monolingual and then acquired another language later on might be able to move through their linguistic resources. And the key feature is that the multilingualism is shared by the community who all share the same linguistic resources. So this means a feature of the language contact environment is the utilization of different resources at different times in different contexts regardless of what language they come from. 
So hopefully this perspective will help you to see that gaining a more nuanced idea of what language a person speaks might help us in this challenging idea of figuring out if the languages that they use influence their thinking. Because unless we truly understand the linguistic resources an individual has available to them, it's very hard to make concrete predictions about how those linguistic structures might influence their thinking, their behavior, or their other cognitive processes. That's all for this snippet of language in perception and thought.